This is going to be slightly different than planned, more interesting, hopefully equally good. Our next speaker is Geoff Freeman. <clears throat> I want you to hear me. Um, however, he cannot be here with us because he's in surgery, in pre-op right now. He had emergency surgery, nothing bad, but something that needed to be performed right away. I will introduce Geoff because virtually he is here with us. Also with us virtually is Carol Wedge and she will be seen and heard at the same time slides sent to us by Geoff will be seen. So human frailty, human ingenuity and the great technology are coming together this afternoon. I will introduce uh, Geoff Freeman. <clears throat> Geoff is speaking to us about architectural trends in research libraries. Geoff is a principal of Shepley Bullfinch, Richardson and Abbott, a Boston-based design firm widely recognized for its planning and design of libraries. He holds Master of Architecture and Master in Landscape Architecture degrees from the from Harvard University Graduate School of Design. And for over the, the 25 years at SBRA, he has been involved in programming, planning, and design of libraries across the country. Some of his recent and current work include library projects at Brown, Cornell, Duke, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, Princeton, Yale, and at Chicago. His, his talk, <clears throat> the talk that he would have given and that now we will hear in a different way, underscored the central growing importance of the library as place and heightened the appreciation of how library architecture affects the teaching and learning process and experience. I personally have heard Geoff speak and have been engaged by his thinking and charmed by his eloquence and style. We look forward to hearing his talk through the voice and with the help of and through the eyes and maybe a different perspective of Carol Wedge. Carol Wedge is the president of SBRA. She joined the firm in 1986 and became a principal in 2000. She has considerable experience in a variety of education and civic projects, but has focused most her attention on the planning and design of academic libraries. In addition to her work with us on the cost and feasibility study for the library edition, her recent work includes projects for Cornell University, Dartmouth College, Harvard Business School, MIT, Princeton University, and Tufts University. Keller received her Bachelor's of Environmental Design from the University of Colorado and her Bachelor's of American Library Association, the Association of College and Research Libraries, and the Society of College and University Planners, and frequently lectures at professional conferences. Today she will lecture in a very, very different context. I welcome the speakers. So under um, sort of spontaneous circumstances, we're going to talk a little about the library as a place and where it is evolving and where we see it going in the near term, um, the current activities and um, things that may inform your conversations over the course of the symposium. Um, so Jim, I'm going to use you as a visual aid. So we're going to start with um, the facade of the Butler Library at Columbia University. Okay. <laughs> Very familiar to Jim Neal, but many others. A uh, library that was really revitalized in the last decade. Um, a substantial contribution um, of many different facets, but really revitalizing the library as the heart of the institution. Um, the next slide is sort of a different approach, not by Shepley Bullfinch, um, but the Seattle Public Library by Rem Coolhouse, which is trying, working to create community in a very different kind of way. Um, the transparency of the building is not dissimilar from the transparency Butler tries to create on the Columbia campus, but again, marks some spectrum of what library as place has come to look like for us, um, particularly in the United States community. The next slide okay. is the Rayner Library at Marquette University, which was really in many ways creating the contemporary interactive space for students on campus. Um, there's a bridge to the earlier building, which is a cafe that creates really a dynamic contribution between 
the collection, the print collection, and the kinds of spaces that are both um, new special collections areas, places for students to gather, um, collaborative spaces, and an infusion of technology and the support staff to um, help run that technology and keep it vital for that institution. Um, the next slide is a view of the Seattle Public Library in the interior. Again, you can see a very dynamic kind of space, inviting activity within the library, inviting different kinds of groups of people to come together, um, really employing transparency in a very creative and different kind of way. Again, one of the things that I think interests us is that although the library is quite different and, and in some ways very contemporary, um, and in some ways radical in what it's trying to propose in terms of the architecture, the formality in which people will gather at tables is not dissimilar. The task lighting that creates a sense of place and invites people to use the library as that rich resource that, that brings many different kinds of formats together um, is still in many ways very similar to some of the environments that we've seen in the past. The next slide is the box of books at the Rauner Library at Dartmouth College, a special collections library that Jeff participated in the master plan of with Venturi Scott Brown Associates. And again, creates a great reading room for the use of those rare materials, but begins to start to showcase those rare materials and articulate the breadth of resources that are available within that collection. Um, the next slide is the American, uh, the antiquarian um, library which is in Boston, the Boston Antineum. And it in many ways is sort of our historic view of a library where art is, is displayed, um, there are print collections, that people are members of that library and continue, continue to use it in a very diverse and um, very active way. It starts, it's in many ways starts to introduce the theme of the reading room and what's the role of the reading room within a library and why are people continue, why do people continue to be drawn to those reading room environments. Um, it's something we've studied as a firm and really looked at how we continue to revitalize those great reading room spaces so they support contemporary use as well as sort of the ongoing integrated use of the print form. Um, the next slide you'll see is the Princeton reading room um, at the Firestone Library, which was, re which was renovated and in many ways needed to be rethought in terms of how it mixed technology with print materials with services and creating a dynamic hub for students. Um, it's a space that's used from morning till night every hour that the library is open and in, in many ways it starts to bring all of those service focused aspects of the library together to really advance the work of students and faculty. The next slide I think is one of Jeff's favorites, but it shows you Central Park from above. And it starts to introduce the idea of what technology and portability might mean for libraries and college campuses in general. Um, the diversity of choices that people have also encourages the library to provide that variety. Um, and so the activity really is driven by the user. Um, and their accessibility to material is very diverse. Um, and starts to inform the kind of the variety and informality you want, we want to introduce into libraries. But also, as you'll see in the next slide, a student reading a book at USC is still very much connected to our kind of historic perspective of the book as a very valuable and tangible productive artifact of print, but also one that continues to be as vital today as it has been. And so it's this variety of environment and engagement that we see happening in libraries today. Um, the next slide, slide 10, is an image of students collaborating with technology within the library environment. And this is an image of Georgia Tech where they have a new commons. Um, they're not calling it an information commons, they're just calling it a commons. Um, slide 11 starts to show kind of the, the level of and diversity of activity of students working together. The commons has become kind of a hub, almost a hearth of information and services for the Georgia Tech Library and in many ways starts to stretch the definition of the activity that we've seen in libraries um, in the past. Um, the students use the commons for a gaming night on Friday nights when libraries typically have shorter hours. In fact, they're stretching the hours to make it part of a community activity of information learning and uh, the activity of students with, with each other as well as with faculty. The next image is Brooklyn College, which also is blurring the boundaries of where technology is, where services are, and what some contemporary environments might look like. Uh, the next slide is at Rice, where it's a much more tectonic kind of environment, 
creating diverse environments with lots of video screens that are used as instruction spaces to use both the hands-on um, technology as well as the visual technology to create a rich environment for learning and start to redefine what tools we can use in terms of learning in instructional um, bibliographic instruction symposium that you might give that are run by librarians as well as faculty wanting to bring their courses, um, their classes into the library to use those kinds of spaces. Um, the next slide, slide 14, is also another dynamic view of that same space at Rice and it can also be used for video conferencing. So it's starting to stretch the definition of what can occur within this library environment. Um, the next image is the common space, basically, at Dartmouth, where there really have been partnerships and integration of computing and library across what I'll call more traditional boundaries. Um, and in many ways, that vision came from the faculty and the students. Um, some of you may, may know but the a provost um, appointed task force really created this identity of students and faculty coming together in an environment where it was supportive of the work and it didn't really matter whether the user understood what was a library supported service or a computer or IT supported service. Um, in many ways that library became the springboard for the inclusion of media within that environment. Um, really the authoring of information, a place to bring faculty development center, academic computing together with the creation of information. So it really became kind of a new kind of partnership for Dartmouth at the center of the campus, bringing students, faculty, and staff, library, IT, computer, media all together within that environment. Um, the next images are a series of collaborative images showing students using a variety of tools. Um, the first one is at Princeton. Um, you can see sort of the, the trustee wall in the background that honors the trustees of the university. But the diversity of activity there is students both studying and working in parallel and working together within these same environments. The next image is at Yale where media was introduced into the Yale Music Library where students again were using the auditory media as well as print materials as well as scores all together within that environment. So it really became about the the activity, not necessarily about the format, and that the library starts to become a place that supports the wide range of formats, as well as honoring, um, in the next slide you'll see also at Yale, the preservation of the environment for those print collections, and really caring for them and making sure that the resources that are both on central campus and remote from campus are really supporting the long-term preservation of those print materials, fostering their use and fostering their availability. Um, in many ways, in the last decade, we've seen people aware of materials they had never known about before, so that the searching technologies that are available and the searching, um, the way of searching and the, and the tools and the more sophisticated tools that are available for that searching make materials that were virtually invisible to people very visible, very accessible and visible to them. Um, in the next slide, you see the Marquand Art and Archaeology Library, which is an unusual library in that it's a closed collection and so it does not circulate. Students from any um, department and discipline at Princeton may use the Marquand collection. It's an incredibly broad collection in terms of size, lots of elephant size materials and folios and rare books materials, all within an environment that's fostering the use um, and integration of technology so the building is fully wireless. Um, students and graduate students have assigned carols to use materials within the library and it was really about making it a welcoming and inviting environment. Um, the space you see is below grade, it's under the entry court to the museum um, and it also celebrates some of the mosaics that were part of the collection and part of the original um, art and archaeology department's focus of study. Moving on you'll see, um, you see the Marquette um, special collections area, which is really fostering and increasingly as special collections are more and more um, within the online catalog, students are finding special collections as resources and research tools much earlier in their academic experience. And so the quality and nature of research going on in the undergraduate experience is really changing and shifting and special collections are really becoming a much more vibrant part of the undergraduate um, research toolkit, um, if you will as well as the sophistication of some of the finding aids um, are making those materials even more accessible to the graduate student and faculty researcher. Um, again, in the next slide, you'll see another image of Dartmouth College um, 
special collections library where the visual connection to the, to the rare book collection is very much a part of the philosophy of that special collections library, really wanting to foster both classes coming to the special collections library, interacting with the curators and the special collections librarians, but also really fostering their use. And in many ways, um, some of the new staff that are there are experimenting with new kinds of outreach to bring classes into the um, rare book library and use those special collections. Um, the next image is also sort of the range of what I'll call um, the softer idea of the library in terms of lounge furniture within historic spaces. Um, and you'll see more of this um, throughout the slideshow, but that really creating an environment through the nature of the furniture that allows students um, to spend hours and hours on end in the library and really support their use. And so that's introduced a new range of seating typologies, of combinations, of creating a variety of environments. This is a revitalized reading room at Columbia that brings different kinds of student um, study frameworks into the building. The next slide is at Columbia Teachers College, a group study room, which I think everyone will say they're seeing more and more of. Our curriculums are changing to be a shifting to be a much more engaged curriculum where group work is really part of the curriculum of many, many classes. Um, and at Columbia Teachers College, integrating the technology and the, the presentation technology into the group study room was very important to them. The next slide is the Cafe Bridge at, Mar at uh, Marquette University, where it's become the social intellectual center of that campus. Previously, the library was much too small, didn't have very many seats, the only, what I'll say, hot coffee or good coffee is available at the campus center. And so in many ways, the students left the library to continue the conversation. Today at Marquette, they're coming to the library to start the conversation. And I think that's very much what we want to see happen in library environments is that the library holds the heart of that scholarly conversation and really fosters it and stretches it. Um, the next slide is the cafe, just to show you a range of, of environments is the cafe at Dartmouth College, which is open 24 hours a day. Um, the services are not available 24 hours a day, but it's very much a student-owned space. And the walls in the cafe are becoming um, a place that they've turned over to student art exhibits. They're curated by the students. They stretch the conversation of what's going on on campus. And it really becomes kind of a hub of the intellectual activity on campus and its visibility, both within the library and at the in the campus at large. Um, the next slide is the Cafe at Columbia, where it too has become kind of an entry point, almost uh, a kind of transition zone, a portal into the library. Much of the library services are up a floor, but a lot of the interaction and faculty meeting and getting together and students meeting and getting together happens within the cafe. Um, so I don't know of a library that's introduced a cafe that hasn't been happy with the result. Um, the next image is Columbia Teachers College. Again, a really small relative to the overall square footage of the building, but a place that extends the conversation, fosters the dialogue, and allows the students and faculty to stay in the library for much longer. They don't need to leave the building for a snack, for a meal, for a cup of coffee. The next image is a photo montage for the new school, and it's um, in Manhattan on um, Main Avenue. And the idea was that the library became a mixed-use place, and it became sort of the introduction into the institution. And so as you came into the library, you were exposed to a wide range of activities, and that there was really visual accessibility, that in many ways in our work, um, we've tried to frame that the building should really open up before the user, and that the range of materials and resources and, and sort of sense of inspiration of scholarship should really come from the environment as much as it does from the content. Um, I think another image that is very successful is the next one, which is Yale Music Library, where it really is an inspiring space um, for whatever you're studying in music, but also for students across the university find it a very attractive environment, one that they're drawn to, and one that we hear from students, they work much longer, they really feel that it's really assisting them in their pursuit and really sort of stretching what's possible for them. Um, and I think that's a sort of very interesting intersection of what behavior is facilitated by the environment. Um, the next slide is a plan of Dartmouth, which is a little bit maybe difficult to read, perhaps. 
but the yellow color indicates the library's crossroads. And um, the Baker Berry Library is the historic Baker Library on the Dartmouth campus, with a, which was a very significant addition that both Jeff and I worked on with Venturi's office to create this sort of axial um, crossroads through the campus. So in, in many ways, you virtually come through any number of five doors and move through the building. For Dartmouth, the library has become really a mixed-use building. Um, it has the history department in it, no, a number of large classrooms, the um, head end for all of their IT um, and servers and, ser and staff that support all of that. So it's really become the crossroads for the um, intellectual community on the campus. In the next slide, you can see a section of that where the yellow, again, the street is indicated um, to really show a way of moving through the building and cascading through the building. And what we were trying to do was really maximize the benefit we could get from the original building in a way attaching to and stretching into um, the new Barry environment, which is much more technological and much more focused on the integration of technology and things that the original Baker couldn't do. Um, in the next slide, you'll see the reference area for um, Dartmouth Library. And the philosophy around the service points was that they were temporal and that they were going to evolve and change. And in many ways, what the uh, building committee could see the day that they moved into the building was only a short distance out. And I think that's probably the question for the symposium. Where do we think um, libraries are going and how far can we see? And what are the components, whether they're the services or the environments or the collections, that are going to continue to evolve and transform and be a, really be responsive to scholarship at the institution. Um, the next image is really a diagram at right of what was possible in terms of creating a commons, um, creating a commons within that environment. And really, the idea was of an immersion concourse um, within the framework of that library. Um, and again, it's a very similar idea to Dartmouth, but it's about bringing people into the library and having the, a real array of resources open before them. Um, a similar diagram was used at Duke University for the Perkins Library um, that you can also see within the next plan. And then the, the site plan is a little bit difficult to understand, but the framework is, I think if you can see the um, quadrangle, is the library as the heart of the, the campus. And I think one of the most important frameworks is where is the library located on campus. And the more it can be central to the activity of campus and the pedestrian movement of students and faculty during the course of the day and into the evening, the more vital it can be. So for the University of Chicago, there's an opportunity to really build on Regenstein's central location and really maximize the benefit the library can have um, for it during the entire 24-hour cycle of the institution. The next image is a photograph at Johns Hopkins where the beach was the historic entry to the campus. Eisenhower Library is in many ways added um, later than the original um, campus was built, the kind of historic quadrangle. And it's a very transparent building. Um, and the work that Jeff's been doing there has been to really think about what's the role of the library for Hopkins, what's its role in terms of fostering the support of faculty research, the undergraduate environment, the graduate student environment, not thinking of them as virtually identical activities, but really stretching to understand what supports that. Um, and coming out of that is really reframing the role of special collections and the rare book collection for the Eisenhower Library as it goes forward. But again, I think um, what Jeff's trying to indicate is the centrality of the library to the institution is very important in terms of the, the campus plan and in terms of the space within the library itself. And many times we're trying to grow central campus libraries to both expand but continue to support their role as crossroads or beacon or um, kind of almost keystone within the university campus. Um, and the next um, slide you can see a plan of Eisenhower where the existing building is to the right taking advantage of the topography to the left with a kind of second um, stair and the proposed expansion for special collections and a great reading room and cafe off to the left. And the idea is taking advantage of the topography but really extending the reach and breadth and contribution um, of the library and beginning to think about um, the cafe and lobby as portals to the breadth of resources um, that the library provides. Um, the next image is uh, uh, 
architectural rendering of what's possible, what might be possible in terms of showcasing those environments and making them transparent to the campus. The next image is a plan, a site plan at Duke. Um, the Perkins Library, the first portion was just dedicated, I think it was last week. Um, it's a significant expansion to Perkins Library, which you can see off to the right hand side. There's kind of the main Perkins and then there's an additional um, square that's the Perkins Library edition and there's in fact a bridge that connects both of those. Within this, you can see sort of a blow up plan of creating a new spine and crossroads and axes um, within the Duke campus. So in many ways, the library is planned within the context of the broader campus goals. Here you can see it zoomed in a little bit closer to the library walk um, and some of the spaces that were developed in terms of supporting both the library walk, but also the extension of the library and its continued development. Here's a plan of the expansion, um, and in many ways you can enter the library in different ways than you could in the past. There are multiple entrances to the library, which do require multiple service points, but also give the library a permeability and a flexibility that it didn't have in the past. Um, the next slide is a, a architectural model starting to show the massing, and um, if you go sort of from the chapel at the back, which is pretty identifiable, and move towards the front, the original historic library is on that quadrangle, green quadrangle, Gothic building that has both special collections and the Perkins Library um, collections. And then behind it, a very large expansion that was done in the 60s. And then the bridge and the new expansion is off to the right. So again, working creatively and working with the university to figure out how to expand the library in its central campus location. Um, without having a negative impact on the overall campus environment and actually trying to use the library expansion as a way to provide new byways, new axes, new pedestrian walkways within the campus. Um, I should mention that Duke also has off-site storage, so they didn't just expand the library on campus, but they also created an off-site storage facility. Um, every library that we're working with is trying to get to a point that they're managing the collections in whatever balance seems appropriate for them. Um, and I think Chicago, as well as a number of other libraries, are starting to look at what does automated retrieval mean? What does it mean for it to be close to the central user? Um, and I think that's an important place for us to be thinking in the next five years and as we go forward into the future. The next slide is Duke, um, an arch uh, architectural computer rendering of how this building fits within the context, but also starts to stretch the transparency of the building and the contextuality. It creates a new tower on the campus related to the many other towers on the Duke campus. And in the next slide, you see the actual physical photograph of the realized building. Um, the new archway and new library path, um, the bridge across that, that um, spine, that pedestrian spine that connects the existing Perkins to a new tower and then to a new expansion. And then off to the left, you can see sort of a glassy section that is an enclosed courtyard space um, that you'll see an image of um, next, which creates an event space at a particular donor, um, was designed many times, um, but just opened quite successfully. And there's cafe space within, cafe within that environment, um, soft seating, the ability to have events, the ability to have speakers, but a really uh, focusing on what dynamic contribution can the library make to the university as a whole? And how does it become really a force in terms of the programming that brings the scholarly community together and making it very visible along that new library pathway within the campus? Um, and so the framework of the interior, the next shot shows kind of the variety of seating, the tables and chairs, the transparency, the view of the exterior, and then also a view back into the original Perkins Library. So it's very much trying to draw off the Gothic architecture, but also be a very forward-looking portion of the building. So the framework is starting with architectural renderings and ideas of what spaces can be. This is an idea for a new reading room at Duke to really frame a, reading, a great reading room that would inspire students and really be the place that they could come to work for extended periods of time, really foster and create that scholarly environment. 
Um, in many ways, we're trying to shift the conversation from not just an information commons, but really a, a scholarship commons or uh, commons of scholarship. So where is the scholarly commons within that library? Um, where is the scholarly commons that brings that, that focus and activity together? And creating on the next slide, you'll see um, the dynamic environment that's the new great reading room for Duke University um, that in many ways takes the threads of the past and weaves them with technology and contemporary use into sort of a bridge for the future. So those are the ends of, that's the end of the, the slideshow. I'm happy to answer questions or also hear folks share their thoughts about what role the library places in terms of its space and, and environment for creating this scholarly community. So I think I got that. The, how does transparency and permeability relate to Regenstein? One of the central um, design themes of Regenstein was for the reading rooms to be quite transparent and quite visible to the campus community, particularly in the evening. Um, and in many ways, before the residence halls were built behind Regenstein from either direction, mm -hmm. that portion of the building was very transparent. I think the difference is, is that when Regenstein was built 28 years ago, I guess, or maybe even a little more, um, the building technologies were not such that you could create a strong preservation environment for the collections. Mm -hmm. And so many of the areas where there were book collections stored, um, it was a very opaque building and there were very few windows. Mm -hmm. And that was because those, at, it, at that time, the architects were very worried about the effect of ultraviolet light on the um, print collections and didn't actually have the technology or the glass technology that was used in Seattle to protect the books from those ultraviolet rays. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, the architecture is sort of responsive to the environment it's trying to mm -hmm. create. Mm -hmm. I would like to add to this that um, the expansion will add to the, to the existing building and will complement it in many ways. Uh, the expansion will hold space for books in a, an environment uh, that is preservation-wise better, safer than the one that we can offer now on our open stacks. The addition will hold uh, spaces to use the collections, spaces that are more comfortable and more conducive to using collections than the, now, the, the ones that we now have. The, the new addition will house a preservation conservation lab uh, that will again perform um, work on materials in spaces and with technology that we now do not have. By doing so, uh, the, the addition also provides uh, the opportunity to, re to rethink and repurpose addition the existing spaces. And this, the, the repurposing of these spaces will depend on the thinking of the library, the thinking of the faculty, the thinking of the task force, and the understanding of future needs of our scholars. So much of it is really not, in my mind, a one-fits-all. But much of what we have seen and what we have heard applies here as well. Carol? Yes? This is James Barrett from Harvard and Ruth. I enjoy your talk. Hi, James. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> Uh, I had a question about in research universities, uh, how do you predict the growth of periodicals with so many periodicals being online now? So I'll give you my answer, but I would say some of my best information comes from the librarians we work with. Um, we're definitely seeing people plan for a decline in bound periodicals, mm -hmm. um, but they're really characterizing it based on their collection and really customizing it mm -hmm. to the projection of what materials they're holding. Um, there are some academic um, journals that will actually not be printed in electronic format in any time, at any mm -hmm. foreseeable future, and many that will be converted. I think what people worry most about is that they'll only be available electronically, and will that be providing the appropriate archival record? Mm -hmm. um, we've definitely seen research universities shift more of their um, bound periodical collections to either closed compact shelving or compact shelving or off-site storage because it's easy for them to um, provide an article for an individual or it's easy for them to make them basically available and visible through um, the online catalog and different mm -hmm. databases. Um, but I think almost every library is predicting uh, 
a measurable decline in mm-hmm. bound periodicals in the future. Mm-hmm. And Judy, you should comment yes, on Chicago. Uh, right, right. Uh, thank you, Carol. My comments are very close to yours. It depends on the collections. Our collections are broad and deep in areas where um, th- Technology and digitization has not come yet and will probably not reach in any foreseeable future. We have also collections that are commonly held by other libraries. In our assessment of growth of collections over the next 20 some years, uh, the the assessment that fed into uh, thinking about space needs, we estimated that where, while uh, growth of collection in monographs would stay relatively steady, growth of um, material, periodical serials would decrease by 5%. We, um, this may be slightly more than that, but not drastically more. Judy, the other area I see people um, predicting a uh, decline in print are government documents as mm-hmm. well, where they're they're seeing migration to either a fully electronic web interface format or CD format as the archival format. Right. So much of what this government publication will be published in electronic form from the outset. But again, we get this type of publications from areas of the world where this is not going to be true so soon. Carol, in almost all of the slides, we saw the changes for readers with their student friends or their colleagues or their professors or the cafe, et cetera. Um, What about the scholar who works alone in his study or Carol and will continue to do so? Are there changes that are going to help him? Well, it's interesting. I think that um, that's a place that would be good to have a rich discussion. There are some people that are really looking for the library to provide those kinds of spaces. Um, And we continue to provide carols, but for that scholar, I don't know if I showed the photograph, um, as as a detailed photograph at Marquand, um, but that they're much larger carols, um, that there are more, there's more materials that people are using with print notes, they're using books, they're using computers, they have their um, Blackberry, you know, so that their tools are much more diverse. And in fact, the, the amount of space that we're providing is almost double what we would have provided, say, 10 years ago for an individual scholar. So we're really trying to focus on the quality of that space. Um, we are hearing people that use set up a study at home. And when they can have those materials available to them at home, do use the library differently. Um, there are some graduate students that really use the library as a place to stage materials. And so they're really collecting the range of materials they're using. So a lockable area is very important to them or um, a locker where they can stage their materials and keep it organized and keep their notes um, organized. I think it's really the incidence of use. Um, Libraries have not been creating as many kind of individual um, scholarly offices. And I think that's more about dollars than it is about if you could, Mm -hmm. you know, blue sky, (laughs) what Mm -hmm. would you provide? Um, but the ones that are available, people are thinking creatively about making them available to people in a flexible way that kind of um, works with their research so that when they are in a mode of really using a rich, diverse of, um, range of materials that take up a lot of space, that the library is really facilitating that. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some research groups that have actually been allowed to check out group study rooms and have that assigned to a research product um, project for the term, that they have a grant-funded research project and they want to do it in the mm-hmm. library, and they're actually um, assigned a space that they can control for you know months at a time. Mm-hmm. I would like to, to add to this, or to stress what you said about it is very much also about money uh, and the ability to support this. Um, the, um, we are thinking about zoning. We are thinking about providing opportunities for different users and for different uses, ways uh, that are comfortable. However, I want to stress that whereas we received funding, 43 million, to, uh, to build a building um, and to realize the building through processing and so on, we have not received funds for repurposing the existing spaces. 
and that will be a challenge. Although we have heard this morning that a library was built and the monies were not there yet. So we are more fortunate and we are closer to the funding that was, that, uh, than way back when Regasheim was built, but it is a, it's a funding opportunity. So if you, anybody would like to step forward, <laughs> this is the time. Hi, Carol, it's Alice Schreier from Special Collections. Um, I'm delighted by the trend that I'm seeing in bringing Special Collections out into the light and the front of the building, which seems very uh, consistent with all the efforts that we're um, uh, making to uh, create inviting and, and welcoming spaces in Special Collections. But I'm also interested in, in what conversations you may have been involved in um, that are looking at separate buildings for special collections. The sort of pros and cons that are emerging of special collections being sort of front and center along with the cafe. I love the fact that those are the two draws at Hopkins, um, which is the old and the new, and I love it, um, working together. But again, um, I'm also aware that at other institutions there is a conversation about special collections in separate buildings, which I've always felt isolates them and makes them harder especially for undergraduates to think about integrating into their work. And, you know, Alice, I think the, you know, the, not many campuses are working from the ideal, <laughs> you know, that there are issues of what are the, op what are the sites that are available, what are the expansion potential that's available. Um, I think some of the um, institutions that are thinking about special collections as a separate building are seeing an opportunity to showcase it in a different way. Um, at Dartmouth, it's in a separate building, but in fact, interestingly, there's a tunnel connection between the Rauner Library and the Baker Library. They're seeing more partnerships across staff. They're seeing more partnerships between faculty development and special collections and use of seminar within the special collections environment to bring those materials into the curriculum. So um, I think it depends on the, uni the institution's unique uh, situation. Certainly at Hopkins, there's an opportunity and a ability for them to expand on the same um, site as a, a research library, and they see that as a very attractive partnership. Um, the same thing's true at Duke, that the special collections library is becoming um, kind of enhanced by the construction, and next phases really do improve the environment for special collections, and in many ways, the uh, resources it has, whether it's addition of seminar spaces or exhibit spaces or the opportunity to grow collections. Um, many people are creating preservation labs on site because there are materials they can service there. Um, so I would say special collections is almost more vital um, and visible than it ever has been um, in sort of my career of planning libraries um, because there are ways to get at some of the other concerns in terms of whether it's technologies or facsimiles or kind of care of the material. I've heard a lot about collections and uh, scholar work areas um, as well as user spaces. Would you give me some of your thoughts on what is being done in terms of reconfiguring staff space? Sure. Um, in many ways, I think the staff space is becoming more um, related to the activities the, of the users and that there's sort of a blurring of the boundary between um, staff spaces um, as very behind the scenes and services as very um, public accessible. Um, in many ways, people are creating zones where there are offices or work areas where users can be brought into that environment so that one-on-one -on -one service can be provided or that in many ways an information um, or reference or service area might be almost a triage point to bring a user um, to a subject specialist or someone who has a specialty expertise. Um, I think the staff resources are being seen as incredibly valuable and so trying to create environments that are more flexible that let the library or the institution respond to um, grant funded ex opportunities or developing new programs, um, new digital initiatives, really focusing on the opportunity to create kind of a metadata environment that really supports the research of the institution is a place that I, I see the staff areas evolving. Um, definitely more meeting spaces for staff to work together on projects, that the, the work of staff is less individual and isolated more collaborative, in many ways more similar <laughs> to the collaboration mm -hmm. we see going on 
um, with both students and faculty in interdisciplinary research. Mm -hmm. It's as if those themes show up in library staff as well. Um, and I think that there's more attention to the, the, re the staff as resource than there used to be in mm -hmm. the past. Mm -hmm. More of the um, functions that could be automated have been. Um, and I think that there are many more partnerships between library staff and other members of institutions, whether it's research labs or a research group or a faculty member or curriculum development committee or group of students, they're really seeing the library staff as exceptionally valuable resources in their work. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carol. Uh, to my ears, this is music, uh, staff as a resource. Many libraries have, because of lack of space for collections or need of space for administrative or other uses, have actually successfully moved their staff, especially processing staff, off-site. This right. library has fought this idea successfully, and uh, now this is even more important than it was in the past. So staff is a resource, a thing never to forget. Uh, we, will, we will continue to give this a high importance. Professor Abbott promises this. <laughs> and and I think I was going to add one more thing, Judy. Yes. I think many libraries are in a situation where they're looking at what their options are, not necessarily feeling like their ideal option exists. And so I think the, the range of choices um, libraries are making are about the resources they have in place, whether it's the, the ability to expand. You know, in Alice's instance, some libraries are probably moving special collections out because they can't grow the collections mm -hmm. or because they can't grow the user space and they're making a choice of the lesser of two evils, neither mm -hmm. one of which is considered the mm -hmm. most optimum. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true of you know universities in general, that there are so many capital projects they're feeling really stressed to make the best choices they can knowing that they're not going to be able to do everything they really would like to do. Carol, we thank you very much for this very effective presentation.